Welcome to the art and science of complex sales. You've joined us in the coaching quarter. This podcast is dedicated to elevating the sales profession. Our listeners range from first-time salespeople to seasoned sales leaders and driven CEOs. They all come to learn from the best in the business. As we interview top sales transformation specialists, go-to-market leaders, revenue thought leaders, and more with only one question on our minds, how we get better together. This 12-episode quarter brought to you by Membrane.com will start to hone in on a key element in performance, sales coaching. Each of our guests speaks to this a bit differently and brings their own unique take, but all cover the topic, how to execute, and the exponential impact it makes. So let's start shining bright and get kicked off with today's guest. Hey, y'all, you're going to have to let me know in the comments if this intro needs to get tossed overboard, but I got to tell you, I love it. It's about Ken Lee Davenport. He joins us today on a captivating cruise of the sales deep seas, where the art of leadership swimmingly reinvents the science of sales. Currently serving as CSO for Leadline, as well as Chief Success Officer of the Sales Leader Roundtable, his journey started back on the deck of Harbor Cruises and led him to beating the captain co-CEO of the organization. He tells the tale today of a journey where he placed customer relationships and building sales cultures as his true north. He outlines a treasure map for us with the key points of his compass being authentic relationships leading to organic sales, coaching and mentorship, and focused intentional team building. So let's get cruising with Kenley Davenport. Kenley, 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 welcome to the show. I am glad to be here, Paul. Always a pleasure to be with you, sir. I'm excited. I'm excited to have you on. And uh, I think we got a lot to talk about. I know we have a lot to talk about because we're going to dive into things like peer to peer networks. We're going to dive into mentoring. We're going to dive into coaching. But first off, I have to, I have to ask you, uh, first time on the show, Kenley Davenport, define sales for me. Define sales. Man, I bet it's a lot, you've gotten a lot of answers over the, over your mini podcast. But for me, it's, it's sort of a two parts. Um, for me, I first off define sales as serving others in a way to improve their lives. So it, to me, sales is, again, serving others. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I want to add something to that. And for me, I call it in the sales environment, it's about owning the relationship. And what I mean by that, Paul, is I care more about others' success than my own. So if I'm talking to a customer for which I, theoretically want to sell, um, I have to have the mindset of, I care more about their success than my own. And so if I go in it with that mindset, I have a great platform and a great opportunity to really serve others in a way they want to be served and to be curious about how to help them and to understand what, what's in their lives that's causing pain problems or issues or take it or creating negative energy. And is it possible that I have something or some experience that can help them be better? And if I can do that, great. And if it turns out then that I have a product that actually can solve some of that, well, that's just icing on the cake. But it certainly starts with serving them and caring more about their success than than my own, which sometimes means I don't ever try to sell them the product. I, I just try to help them. And what usually comes for me in this case, Paul, is that I get a lot more people who come back and say, hey, wait a minute. Let's talk more specifically about your specific thing that you happen to be associated with. And then all of a sudden, the next thing I know, I've got all kinds of sales happening around me. Well, and you've had a uh, you've had a great career in sales to demonstrate this and actually come to that definition. So do you mind a little bit going into some of the background? Because I, I I think you're, we've talked about your story. I think it's absolutely fascinating and and your transition throughout the sales world and, and running companies and all that. I, I really think it would be a great, great story to tell. Thanks for asking. And I'll try to be brief because I've been doing this a long time now. <laughs> and, but I have to say my story started, um, you know, not long after college, you know, I won't get back into some of those formative things that I think shaped me right out of college. But really, I would say my first job where I really started getting what I would call unbelievable mentors was I was in the Harbor Cruise business. And I started in the bottom of that opportunity. 
I was a, a sales supervisor, so I, I did start out pretty early helping others. Um, I was, I, I, I think I was a pretty good salesman myself, but my best skill wasn't about selling. It was more about collaborating and listening and helping other people achieve success. And I think there's where my sales leadership came from. Um, but I certainly could, could roll the sleeves up, as they say in the old world, carry the bag and go do the work. And I did, and I did that a lot because my, um, my mentality was I wouldn't ask anybody to do anything I wouldn't do myself. So I would usually in the beginning, early in my career, just go do it to show them, right? Sort of lead by example. Um, but it all started back in those early cruise days where I learned how to really listen to customers and, and, and listen to staff and put those things together. And we rose up in that company over a fairly short period of time from just being that entry sales guy to being the general manager of a cruise ship and then the regional manager of a number of cruise ships all the way up to being the CEO, co, I should say co-CEO. I had about half the company. I shared it with another co-CEO. We reported to the CEO of the business and um, we really built a pretty big business and it really grew. And today that company still exists. I'm not a part of it, haven't been for many, many years. They've been bought and sold several times. And when I was there, it started as 13 cruise ships. When I left, it was 40. And the, today, they're well over, I think, over 200 different entities. All of them are not cruise ships. Some of them are now sightseeing vessels. Some of them are speedboats. They got a number of different things. I just take great pride in building that foundation. And I still have lots of friends around the world that were all part of what we called that family and all doing well in life. Um, then I migrated into our parent company when they sold the cruise business. I was one of the few people being the CEO of the cruise business were retained. My co-CEO thought about sticking, they wanted to retain him as well, but he ended up getting another really fantastic job in another organization. So he took that. Um, but I, I stuck with the core business, you know, after they sold off the subsidiary and, and went into an area that no one thought I could succeed at. It was some, something I hadn't done before. I so saw a whole different product line, a whole different everything. But Paul, I believe leadership trumps everything. I don't believe product knowledge, industry vertical knowledge. I think it's helpful. I think people mm -hmm. that have a vast vertical or, or product knowledge, you know, specific industry understanding is helpful to them, but I don't think it's the absolute requirement. I think great leadership is a requirement that transcends all, um, all organizations. So yep. um, we were able to take the smallest, most underperforming division and make it one of the strongest, most best performing divisions. That led me to an even higher level, taking on a more global job. It, it, this is a multinational company, you know, serving 80 countries. Um, and I took on a multinational and a global job. And um, we did pretty well at that until I finally got to the point where my next step was, you know, in a big multinational to be a CEO of a division. And I had a very good mentor at the time who was the CEO of the overall company. And she sort of said to me, Paul, um, hey, um, you could retire here. Uh, you can, you've done very, very well, but I know you're a change agent type of person. And um, I just don't think, you know, based on the current um, progress of the company, that you probably will get the chance to be a division CEO. It's just the way the world's working, the way we're evolving as a business, the way everything is happening. It's not has nothing to do with who you are. It just has to do with our direction and how we're going to think about it. So great. I, I didn't like to hear that, but I but I understood it. I was a part of the, you know, the leadership team. I understood where the mission of the company and where it was going. That being said, it just happenstance that a few months later, I got approached by a private equity firm who was going to buy a business that I had some knowledge of uh, or knew the industry pretty well. Now that industry vertical knowledge played a role and they contacted me and um, they really just wanted to pick my brain for understanding the industry itself. And that led me to them recruiting me to be their CEO. And so we grew that company rather quickly. In 27 months, we grew it, um, I will tell you, to well over $350 million, from $80 million to over $350 million in 27 months. So wow. fast scale growth. Um, they then wanted to sell the company. So I exited. They sold the company. But in that process, I did a number of due diligence acquisitions and things of that nature. And so I leveraged that experience and then help started helping other firms that were private equity back. I would partner with the C-suite teams and learn how to help them 
really figure out how to exceed beyond their wildest expectations. And on almost all of those roles, with the exception of one or two, I really led the sales and marketing effort um, because oftentimes they're growing, say, 15 or 20 percent and think that's fairly fantastic. When private equity comes in, they sort of expect three or four times that. They have mm-hmm. a little bit different expectation for growth and for the speed of growth. And they're willing to fund it. They're willing to put their money where their mouth is, but they need people that can take that money and invest it wisely and get the result to come from it. And I was one of those guys who I think sort of saw the bigger picture and could show founders how to how to do that. So so um, so take me. I, I, what, there's one thread that comes through this, which is it's going to take me to some of your your most recent work too. But how does the very beginning of that and your view of sales, right? So uh, owning the relationship, serving serving others, and I'm hearing leading as a big portion of that. How does your view of sales that you formed early on actually translate into you being, you know, co CEO and then CEO and then tripling companies? I mean, how does that foundation make that impact? I believe it taught me very quickly to when I said own the relationship as part of that foundation. It's about I'm very curious person, and, I, and I, I teach other people, in order to be an effective leader, you have to be extremely curious. You have to sort of be what I call a journalist or a detective. I like to use these two analogies. In the old days of journalism, you we thought of journalists as completely objective. They just went and got the facts and laid out the facts as they, as they really laid. A detective does something similar. There's a something that a, a detective and a journalist do very well. And that means they go into every situation with no prejudgment. They don't walk in already having bias to what's happening. They don't already think they know the answer. If you're a detective looking at a, a crime scene, and it's a typical crime scene you've seen before, but you automatically assume that's what it is, you will miss real good clues. You have to be curious. You have to really have no judgment. Look at everything objectively. And if you do that, so I sort of learned that in the sales environment early. And when you own the relationship, meaning the foundation you asked me about, if I can go in there with this no prejudgment, great curiosity, and I care about serving them and, and helping them succeed, whether I succeed or not, I put that all first. That's value packed. Customers recognize that in the way you ask the questions, the way you talk to them, the way you interact with them. They feel this. When they do that, they trust you, right? Then they start relying on you. And the next thing you know, they're buying a lot of stuff from you. I've got customers today in the education segment that will call me up and superintendents of schools, business managers, they'll call me up and say, hey, Kenley, um, I've come across this. Have you ever come across that? I think it sort of has a play on what I'm doing, but you know me. Give me your objective opinion about it. I'm not, they're just asking me my, my consulting environment. I'm a trusted advisor. Uh, they know that I care more about their success than my own, so I'm not going to bullshit them. Basically, I'm going to tell them what, what I think, and I yeah, learned I, that early on. Well, no, that in that approach, I've um, I've never heard it described that way. So, thank you. Which the detective or the journalist? Again, I've never heard it, and going in with absolutely free of bias, right? Because one of the things that we do oftentimes as salespeople is we'll go in and we we won't be free of bias. We'll be going in and we'll say. <laughs> Dang, you know what? Uh, these guys, they, they kind of just need us. They, that's all. They just need us, right? And um, well, but you, when you, you, yeah, you think you immediately they, have a bias when yeah. you say they need us. I know we want to feel that. And I have to admit, we're not perfect human beings. I don't go to every situation not thinking I want to find an outcome that's positive for my company and my association. Mm-hmm. That I'm with. No, I don't go into it that way. But I try to minimize those biases, right? I try to really understand where they're coming from and take that approach. And I think that's what ends up leading me to a better place. It, and it's not its not perfect. It's not 100%. It doesn't mm-hmm. work you know, a thousand percent of the time. But it actually, I feel on average, is a wow, why I have such a big personal network is because people know that I, I, I'm not in it for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, the outcome often is that I, you know, something Zig Ziglar always said, uh, uh, one of the early books I read in sales, help enough, help enough other people get what they want, you'll get what you want. 
So that sort of stuck with me way, way back in the day, Paul. And it goes back to owning the relationship and serving people. Think of that statement that Zig Ziglar said, how many decades ago at this point? Yeah. You know, so. I would, I would drive in my dad's Oldsmobile with him, uh, listening to Zig Ziglar tapes. And I could tell you at that time in my life, I did enough driving with him that I probably had them all memorized. And so did he, but, uh, yeah, that is absolutely it. And that it, it's funny you say that. Cause that is one of the, the heart and the core of, of, uh, of sales and leadership. And he was hitting it then. And so you took this and you've taken it recently into a passion of yours, uh, the sales leader round table. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. One of the things, thanks for asking. Um, one of the things that I learned, and I'll go back and tell you a little bit of the story of the sales leader round table. When I was in corporate America in this big multinational company, one of the things that afforded me was the chance for them to pay for me to go to MBA school. One of the things they told me Hey, you're in this big company now. You're competing with all these guys coming out of these great schools with MBAs, et cetera, et cetera. You probably need to have that too if you're going to keep progressing. You have the work ethic, you have, you know, the business, but you need to add this to your toolbox. So they paid for me to go to MBA school and I did a fast track, you know, in, in person, you know, on campus one year MBA program that they let me be off, you know, a week a month to go do that. And so um, I did it and then was very successful at it. But this is what I learned from that. It wasn't the books and the theories and all of those things and even all the case studies that we did. And God, we read a lot. I think we read like 22 books in a year. I mean, that was a lot for me. I'd hardly read a book in a year prior to that. And I'm reading 22 in one. And so I learned how to read with effect. And But more importantly, what I learned was every week we had a new group we had to work with. 29 people in my class. Every week the group was changed up and we had problems to solve as part of the class work. And you had to go solve these cases or solve these business problems that are real. And they connected them back to our industries and our businesses. And they said, okay, you know, and you, everyone's got, and every time you, you get into the group, you got to take a different role. You can't always be the boss of the group. You know, you got to take different roles. And what I really learned from that was I learned more from listening to my classmates and their experiences, and how they tackled things and the perspective and the diversity of thought. They brought to the table, not just in the four person group I was in weekly, but when we all got back together and spent four hours going through the cases of everyone's group and hearing all the different processes and perspectives and how we all saw the same material and thought about it differently, right? It taught me so much. And I brought that back to me when I came back to my corporate job. I didn't think of it as I got this MBA and I'm smarter than everybody else and I can do spreadsheets better than others. I didn't think of it that way. I thought of it as I became a better listener, a better questioner. I started getting through the noise of information. There's so much information. Some of it is not relevant to you, right? It's part of the information, but it's really not relevant. And so you learn about that quickly. And so then I applied that. And so sells you a round table. When I started thinking about how do I give back to the profession that's given me so much, I believe that sales is a profession just like a doctor. And just like a pro athlete, like an actor, you have to study your profession to be good at it. And you just don't, you don't study it for a month and you move on. The greatest actors continue to go back to, to their mentors, continue to go to their coaches, continue to look for ways to get better. Athletes, we see it in athletes easily. Great athletes get lots of people around them. A lot of people don't realize, Paul, that the top CEOs in America, if you went to the Fortune 100 CEOs, and ask every one of them, uh, who is your mentor or where are your mentors and who are you mentoring? They will give you a laundry list and many of them pay people, pay people to mentor them. Other ex-CEOs, other former board members, they were CEOs of three other different companies that maybe sit on their board. They look to these people to mentor them doing their job. They are trying to get better at their job every day. That's why they make $30 million a year in those top companies, because they know they have to really be good to, make, to keep making that kind of money and be put in that position. So they were investing in that stuff. We just need to take that down to the lower the lower ranks of, of corporate America. And that's what I try to do with the Sales Leader Roundtable, a peer-to-peer professional development network where people can be in a safe place, 
they can say, I don't know how to do this. Someone else know how to do it. You can't usually say that to your boss in a small to medium company. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, even in a large multinational, when I became senior vice president in charge of a whole lot of stuff, there was no training for me. And I couldn't go to my boss and say, I'm not sure how government relations work. I had to go figure it out. And right. So I went out and got mentors. I went out and got people to help me move quicker, to learn faster. Um, it would be objective that I could say, I don't know something to and not feel threatened that they're going to go to my boss and say, hey, you got an idiot running your business because he doesn't know anything. Because that's so true of everything. So let's dive on three things. So you've, you've used three terms and I want to, uh, I want to dive on the importance of each uh, specifically. Let's dive specifically on the sales profession, but let's three terms that I've heard are coaching, mentoring, and peer to peer. So I think those are all really essential. I think many of them are different. Right? There's you know, different aspects to them, but I think they're all there's all in, they're all essential in this mix. So let's dive into number one: coaching. What? What's a good sales coach to you and how do we need to be coaching people in the sales industry? This is my take on coaching. Coaching is about skill development. Um, it is very specific. It is very intentional. And it's designed to help a person fundamentally get better at some skill. Um, you, are, you are transferring that. You are showing it. You're making them practice. You're working with them to do it. You're role playing it. You're making it personal to them. Coaching is individual, by the way. It cannot, you cannot coach in a group session. That's a different thing you're doing. You know, you're, you're, you are training. That's not coaching. Coaching mm -hmm. requires people to practice and to go about it. When you're on a football field and you're learning footwork as the, as the quarterback, someone's is filming you and watching you and calling you out and giving you you know, like dancing step counts or whatever, until you do it so much, you make the seven step backs you need to make, you scan the field, you make two steps forward and you lean into your pass. I'm just making that simplistic, but you do it so many times that it becomes natural and routine. Same in golf. The professional golfers do not get up over the ball and think about their stance and think about their grip and none of those things. They are thinking about a few things, but all that basic stuff, they've got down to a science that they just do it perfectly almost every time. It's the little nuances that they're adjusting. I think that's the same in the sales world or same in the business world is you got to have someone who's helping you take your strengths and make them better. And I always worry about you can't take really strong, really bad weaknesses. You can maybe there is some judgment in leadership about how much you put on your weaknesses. There are things that you are weaker in that you need to polish up on. But if you're super weak at something, the chance of you becoming a great professional is, is, is lower. And mm -hmm. so you have to really think about that in the big scheme of things. So you have to select people in the right seats on the bus so that they're not put in a position that they have a lot of core job skills that they're weak in, right? They got to be sort of medium, the, the, the strong in most of the job skills. And that means you're on the right seat of the bus. You know, they have the capacity to learn it and to do it. Oftentimes, somebody with really weak skills doesn't have actually the capacity to get actually stronger. And that's what you have to sort of figure out. So coaching to me is skill development and it's intentional and it should really be done by your ball. Somebody close to you, the action, close to seeing you in action, helping you do it. So something you said there really, really kind of struck with me, which was that one-on-one. -on -one, and then you were talking about the football field and I, I, I never played, never played football as a team sport, but I, I was an I was an athlete. I played soccer and swam and that type of stuff. But I, something you said struck me there was the coaching really occurs not necessarily in the the I me the the coach giving you a set or the coach giving giving the speech to the team. The coaching really occurs in that time when they pull you aside and they say, "Here's how you're doing it, and here's how to change." Right? Here's what you're doing. Okay, Paul. Here's what your start is. Now, here's the three things we need to work on. Come back and tell me what you're working on. I'll, I'll give you feedback on. So the coaching happens in that one-on-one -on -one session. There's a lot of other things that coaches do, right? There's athletic coaches, but the actual impact really happens in that one-on-one -on -one communication. Yes, it really does. And that's why it's also intentional. 
you know, I don't want to get mixed up the coach on the side of a football field or the coach in the baseball dugout or the coach on the on the side that they, they are, you know, they got the term coach, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what we're really talking about is that person who is helping you skill develop. And, and that's what I see coaching is about. And that's true of, of athletes as well. But yeah, they, they also wear some other hats in that process because um, there's other things going on. But um, in the pure sense of how we how you described it in the three things of coaching, mentoring and, and, and peer to peer, you know, that's how I define coaching is that very intentional process. Well, let's go to so skill development. We need we need that. We need that continual. We need that, you know, a lot in sales. Now, what is mentoring and how, how does that impact it? Well, mentoring for me is is not coaching. It is helping a person self-realize. It is giving a person options to think about. It is pointing people to the resources required and maybe sharing experiences and wisdom. But ultimately, in coaching, we're not, I mean, mentoring, we're not skill developing. We are um, creating an environment for someone to develop themselves. Because ultimately, um, you're, you are allowing them to explore, to fail, to try things, to mold their own abilities to do things. Mentoring usually starts happening when you have a pretty strong skill set already. You're not getting as much time in skill transfer. You are now in a little bit higher place where you have some of that down, um, but now you need to be thinking about your impact on people. Now, one of the things that I have found with the best mentors is they help you understand your impact versus your intent. Because most people have this intent, but their impact is not equal to their intent. They, they did not realize it would have this impact one way or the other, positive or negative. And so um, a good mentor helps people realize everything they do is their impact or an intent equal in their impact. And, and, and are they intentional with their impact? You know, the, the worst case scenario is we sometimes at our significant other spouses, you know, we get we snap. Right. We, we say something in the heat of some some exchange that we're impact and intent don't always equal and it, it actually flares things up even more right I, I use that analogy mm -hmm. because everyone who's been married realizes that that takes work that life's not perfect right and so now take that to your business environment you are having a lot the more a leader can have his impact and his intent be equal um the better and so i also think mentors helps people really self-reflect because a lot of growth comes from the ability to own your own situation, to handle conflict, because oftentimes what people are facing, I believe, is internal and external conflict, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with it. And I think great mentors, because of what they do, help people sort of better put themselves in a situation to minimize that conflict that's going on in everyone's lives and everyone's business lives, particularly. And so, um, again, one of the weaknesses and, and the things that I do with companies is I see their avoidance of conflict, which means they're not living up to the truth. They're not sticking to their values. You know, they're not necessarily really bad about it. It's just not perfect. And, and, I, and in my world, the more clarity you have in all of that, the more success you will have. But Lencioni, right? Five dysfunctions of a team. Yes. Uh, avoidance of conflicts is what is, is absolutely one. critical. I think that's number one. Yeah. yeah. And it's, but the way you said this, I'm going to repeat it because, well, one, I need to repeat it for myself, but two, I think I'm going to repeat it for all the listeners is mentors helping people align their impact with their intent. That is one yep. of the, that is one of the biggest things that I do find with leaders when you, when you don't, and you can't do that, especially in sales as well, right? When you can't align your impact, uh, or if the impact of something you say is not in line with the intent of what you are saying or, or your actions, right? Then that chasm starts to create that breach of trust. And I, right. geez, I've experienced that so many times in my life where I'm like, but I try, you know, oh my gosh, that's not what I meant. It's not what I meant to be. It's not who I meant to be as a person, but. You're right. Great, great mentors actually point that out to you. That they do. They do. And they do it in a very 
um, because they're not trying to change you. They're just trying to have you have awareness. And, 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 you know, again, one of the things I've personally learned, and and I'm not perfect at it, but the more self-awareness you can have, the better off you'll be. The more you can own that, you know, something, my tone was really bad there. And I've got to figure out how to not have that tone. Right. And you don't have any Remember, Sometimes this is subtle. It's not what you say. It's just, it's how you say it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, all of those things I have to personally watch. I'm an enthusiastic type person. You know, I have a, a high energy level. Um, and that comes across. I have to pay attention because that can come across as I'm not listening. I am telling you what I think and, 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 and you're interpreting it as I've got to do what, what I say. And actually, I'm not saying that. Right. My intent's not in my mind. I'm saying here are your options. I'm just enthusiastic about it. And, I, and my tone is excited and, and forceful and you think you read it as i'm being told what to do mm-hmm. and that's not the case so a lot of times when i catch myself and that happens probably monthly or weekly i catch myself and i say to people hey i don't want you to misread my tone hey i don't my, i don't want you to misread what i just my the options i just provided i'll say to them these are the four options based on my experience you pick the ones best for you or pick another one i, I don't really don't care just pick something and, and tell me what it is and let's go make that work. You know, mm-hmm. it's up to you. Um, if you fail six times in a row on that same situation, if, if I'm the sales leader and you're the salesperson, then I might have to have a little bit of different conversation with you. Now, if you go back to skill development, it's not mentoring anymore. It's skill development. I've got to go back and say, hey, these are some areas that you're not fundamentally getting. You know, they're, they're core to, to, to your the success of this job and the success of your role. And so... But- I, I like this distinction that you're making because oftentimes, oftentimes we, we leaders try to be, and I say we, cause I, I, I lead a team, right. Uh, and I've led teams for a long time, but we try to be everything to everyone and that's not good to anyone, right? It is, it's absolutely not good to anybody. So the distinction and even being able to discuss that distinction of, okay, this is coaching. This is skill development versus, okay, I'm, I'm, if you're willing, I'm ready to take on a role of a mentor for you and help you. But, uh, that is something different. And so let's go to the third, the third thing that we discussed, because I think uh, I want to make sure that, uh, we keep on time and get these through. But one of the things you're also really passionate about is, as you mentioned, is this peer to peer and not just peer to peer in company, because a lot of times that just becomes a, a wine fest. Um, it's, it's, it's facilitating actively facilitating opportunities around peer-to-peer groups that can improve you and your role. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it comes back from my earlier story about my MBA program and seeing the impact that it had. I'll take that one step further. When I went back to my multinational company, instead of uh, relying on all the people within my division to try to solve some of our problems, I oftentimes would create we in, our, in a big corporation, you end up with lots of task force to solve problems within the business. You've probably heard that story before, right? That's yeah. not new. Um, so I would I would be leading these task forces or beyond these task forces, and I would force for people from outside our division, from outside our inner circle, people from different um, oh, divisions and different roles to be on the task force because it brought this different perspective, this different diversity of thought. I use I, I call it. To the table, and we solve so much more, so many more problems, so much faster because of this process. And so, between those two things, and then I, I started experiencing it within my own company, building my own networks, so to speak, outside of my division. Um, that I went as I was thinking of the sales leader roundtable. I went well, this peer to peer, I think, is extremely important because it needs to be the safe place that I can come and have people that that are walking in my shoes. They they have similar situation. And then what we can do in this in this roundtable, instead of just coming, showing up every week and saying, hey, everybody, what's on your mind, which we can do, we facilitate it with, we're going to bring a topic that you've all been talking about that you'd like to have more insight on. We're going to find a thought leader in that space who has that knowledge of that topic. And we're going to introduce it in our sales leader roundtable. And we're going to spend a few, you know, let's call it half the time. Um, talking to this person about that content. But then afterwards, we're going to facilitate a shared discussion about 
what everybody took away from that and how they're leveraging in their business, how they're maybe not leveraging their business. Um, maybe somebody has done some of that and failed at it. And they'll say, hey, I tried that. It didn't work. And this is what happened. Uh, and this is why I think it didn't work. This, this discussion we're all having is helping everybody exponentially learn because they're hearing from their peers. They're seeing real life situations. And I've come to learn it doesn't matter if you're in the telecom industry, in the manufacturing industry, in the service industry, or selling cars. It all, it's all the same basic fundamentals or the same basic issues that a sales leader is facing no matter where they are. And so we're able to, to tap into that. And not only do we do that in real time, like on a big Zoom group meeting like we're having and, and building this podcast, but you now are building a network of people that maybe, Paul, I'm facing something in my business as chief revenue officer, your chief revenue officer of your business. We probably have a lot of similar challenges. Why can't some days that I just, you know, I'm not competing with you in any way, shape or form. Why don't I just pick the phone up and call you because I know you and we know each other and we sort of trust each other. You, you know what? You're just going to tell me what you really believe. You're going to give me really good advice. Whether I use it or not doesn't matter. It matters that I get your perspective, your opinion, your experience. I'm, 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 gain, I'm gaining from your experience. You got 30 years. I got 40 years. We got 70 years of experience to lean on, right? So that's good. And so, and if I do that three or four times against maybe a really tough problem I have against people that I can trust and I know think the world of me, despite me not knowing something, we're, I'm going to be a lot better for it. And I have just found that every time I've done that, I do better. I, I, I either stopped myself from making a decision I was getting ready to make because I didn't realize the impact and intent was going to be what it was because other people were telling me, hey, that's how I would view it. Well, I didn't think I would, because I don't, didn't view it that way. And yeah. that's why I love about the peer to peer is because you're getting these different viewpoints. It helps you go back to great leaders make, having very intentional impacts. They're intentional. We we think that they're not. We think that, oh, they're just this great leader because they're charismatic and they got all these things and they've been successful. Now, great leaders are very, very intentional. There are some naturalness to, to people. Some people have some natural gifts and natural ability, um, but it's mostly intentional. Well, also, one of the things that uh, I know is people struggle with across the world right now, right, is this... Uh, Matt Dixon in, uh, in the jolt effect described this really well, which is this fear of messing up. Right. And, and we know though, when you're, when you can actually bring that into a community, leaders have to make decisions. Like they have to, it's one of the things they absolutely have to do to make things move forward. Right. But being able to bring that to a community to bounce it off people that have made similar decisions instead of sitting alone in yourself and your computer and your research or just your internal team. Um, man, that is so valuable. Yeah, we get fatigued. Um, I call it, you know, we get in our own forest. We start believing our own rationale. We we do have bias. We do have bias. And mm -hmm. this helps us eliminate or minimize its impact on the outcome. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned Jolt Effect. I, it's a book on my desk right now that it's, you know, in my stack to read. Uh, I hear it's a pretty hot topic right now. One of the, one of the, the more better books out there. Um, but yeah, um, having these abilities to gauge yourself. I try to every week ask myself, have I gotten somebody else's opinion on this um, yeah. that's outside of my, my my own little network, right? If I just keep going to my inner network. We all sort of believe our product does this and, it, and, and customers should like it because of this. I go, okay, we're not wrong, but we need to stop and listen to what really the impact is from others. So I spend my time when I'm out with sales vice presidents and sales reps on calls or, or peering in, I, they, I try to make sure they recognize that 90% of what I'm doing has nothing to do with them as the salesperson doing their job. It has to do with me listening to how the customer reacts to all of you, to you and how they think about the words and the, and the, and the statements you make and what questions it drives from them. What is the impact you're having on them is what I'm actually trying to understand. And I'm looking for best practices. Yeah, there's 10%. Yeah, I see you in action. I, I, I can maybe, I will notice a few things you might could um, improve upon or whatever. I can give you some feedback against. But 90% is 
I'm not really thinking about how do I make you a better salesperson. I'm thinking about how do I learn from the customer. Yep. Then some element of helping the salesperson comes from it. But um, I, well, you need you need to do that. It, 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 and I'll. We got to we got to wrap up here because we're getting to time. One thing I will mention, because you uh, with Jolt, to me, what what really struck me and which ties directly to the work that you're doing and just that observing, right? Going on observing. This is not a sales thing that he generally talks about. He is talking about a societal societal thing that's going on that people are having more trouble making decisions for fear of consequences of bad decisions than they ever have before. Right. And for, I think there's a lack of community in that and lack of, so he translates it really well to how we should then sell because of it. I think what you're doing is how we should uh, is, is incredible because it's how we listen, how we dive in with peer to peer networks and how we support the, the people outside to give them a group and how to support salespeople, sales leaders, and how to change their behavior they're still responsible for changing the behavior, but that peer-to-peer -peer can can provide that in a big way. I think that's very helpful. Well, I know as we're cl getting close to time, Paul, I wanted to say, you know, these three things we've been discussing it gets into the bigger umbrella for me. And, is, and we, we and I'm going to make the comment of you, you reading that book and, and using it in quotes, and I've got it on my desk. Is it's about professional development in general, and you every individual has their own their own professional development. The people we, the biggest, most successful leaders, CEOs, athletes, heart surgeons, whatever they are, they are constantly in professional development mode if they're at the top of their game. You know, and, and, and because they're at the top of their game, they are really investing in their own professional development. And, and, and there's three ways to do that. You can ask your boss to coach you on things or at least be accepting of great coaching. You know, a lot of times people don't want to accept coaching because it's, it's work. It's, it feels bad. You know, sometimes it feels bad in the beginning, right? And it's because it's you're 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 uncomfortable because you're not good at something and you and you feel like you're bad at it, right? And so you don't want to keep doing it because it's conflict. Then there's mentoring, uh, and then there's peer to peer, and then you can go out and still do things on your own, like keep getting books and reading them and doing other things in professional development. I just say to all people listening, if you're not doing something to keep growing, I don't care if you're you're 21 or 61. You need to keep developing and growing as long as you're in the workforce. When you decide to get out of the workforce and retire, you're probably going to find yourself professionally developing again, but probably in some some other type of hobby to occupy mm -hmm. your time, right? Because great leaders just don't stop. You know, they keep going till they're gone. And so they go do it in a different way. It's just not the same type of professional development. They go learn how to paint. They go learn how to do woodworking or they learn how to hike and identify trees, you know, whatever they're doing to live in their life, you know, in, in retirement, they're still the greatest people are still professionally developing themselves. It was the habit they always had. When they were, they were in the business world. Well, Kenley, how do people, how do people find you uh, if they have questions on your take on professional development, on the sales leader roundtable, anything else you're doing, how do they find you? Well, I'm obviously found on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. It's just Kenley Davenport if you get the spelling right. Um, I, I certainly can also be found at the Sales Leader Roundtable. Um, our, our email address, our simple email is just info at salesleaderroundtable.com. This is just a, uh, you, you can also find that on LinkedIn as well. We put out a lot of content. We do a lot of things. It builds leadership acumen and sales acumen. And we just bring people together. Um, it's a a low investment, high impact opportunity is what I tell people. It's an hour, a month of your time, um, but it affords you a lot of other benefits that um, that we've talked about here today. But or if you if you come learn about the sales leader downtown, there's a bunch more benefits to it that we can outline for you. But um, we're excited to have anybody who has any any leadership role, particularly in the sales area, and that has a couple of direct reports, will be a perfect fit for the sales leader roundtable. Well, that's awesome. And I've been a part of it. I, I will vouch for it. It's a, a great, great use of time. And I really appreciate it. I know it's a passion project and an absolute love to for you. And uh, you guys, you and Jim are, are doing great work there. Keep it up. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, keep elevating the sales profession. Everybody, please be reaching out to Kenley. If you have any questions for him, he will absolutely make himself available, I know. And uh, with that, we'll sign off for today from the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Keep shining bright, keep selling, and have an amazing, amazing day. 
Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Please take a moment, like, subscribe, share this podcast on all your favorite platforms, and let's get the word out. This podcast is proud to be brought to you by Membrane.com. We are the world's top B2B sales platform. And in the world of B2B sales, with everything from prospecting to business acquisition to managing complex growth, Membrane has the right size technology for your sales team. Our latest innovation, the Coaching Cockpit, empowers your leaders, managers, and team with the information and tools they need to take their skills to the next level and to take advantage of the exponential power of effective sales coaching. With our technology and the top team of sales partners around the world, Membrane is helping to achieve our driving vision. This is, quite simply, elevating the sales profession. To learn more, find us at www.membrane.com, that is M-E-M-B-R-A-I-N.com, or contact us via email at sales at membrane.com. Keep shining bright and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.